today is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Hallelujah. So where you are tonight, today here in the sanctuary, and if you are watching us live, we greet you this morning, and I want you to start your day with giving him praise and commanding your heart, commanding your voices, commanding your feet to do a little jig for Jesus today, and just kind of get warmed up for the presence of God. So today is going to be a call and response. I'm going to teach you a song, and you're going to learn this song so that you can sing this song in your church and also in your chorus. And I want you to be excited this morning because our God is good. Do you believe that? Do you believe that this morning? Our God is good. Here we go. I command my soul to bless the Lord. I command my
awake by now because you guys are making a joyful noise unto the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Go ahead and wake everybody up on today. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So I'm going to teach you another song, and it is called Revelation 19. So how many of you all think you're Sopranos? If you sing Sopranos, raise your hand. Raise your hand. All right. I'm a Sopranos because I'm going to need your help. Sopranos. If you're an alto, raise your hand. I'm going to need all the altos to participate. If you are a tenor, there you go. All right, Jennifer, we're going to sing a tenor note. All right. And if you just sing and you don't really know what part you sing, raise your hand. All right. It's okay because we're going to place you. We're going to place you. All you got to do is listen. Trust me and listen. So the first part, it goes like this. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory, honor and power unto the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, He is one. All right, I want you to sing that with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation. Salvation and glory. There you go. Honor. Honor and power unto the Lord our God. For the Lord. For the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, He is one. We're going to take it from the top. We're going to take it from the top. Hallelujah again. Come on. Hallelujah. Salvation. Salvation and glory. Honor. Honor and power unto the Lord our God. For the Lord. For the Lord. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. Yeah, yeah. The Lord our God, He is wonderful. So here's where the altos come in. So altos, you're going to sing what I sing. I'm going to sing it first, and then you're going to sing it. And once we get all of everybody learning their parts, we're just going to worship on this song, all right? So the altos, you're going to say... Oh, listen. Hello. 
Then we got the tenors who are going to sing their part. All right? And the tenors, they sing. Here we go. Tenors. Hallelujah, sing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation. Salvation and glory. Honor and power. Honor and power. He is wonderful. Dinners. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. Honor and power. He is, he is wonderful. Worship the Lord, amen? Hallelujah. All right, so we're going to start the soprano, the altos, then the soprano's going to come in, and then the tenors are going to come in, all right? Here we go. From, hallelujah, sopranos, altos, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. transition and my I, I know I just need to try it again here we go good morning all 
right now I need you all to turn around and look at the ladies coming in and say, come on in. All right, we'll take it for what we got. I got limited time this morning and I got a whole lot to say, so I'm gonna move fast. So if the lady next to you looks really confused, just let her know you'll catch her up later. We're gonna start today in 2 Samuel. I love Old Testament, but if you've never read your Bible, please start in the New Testament. It's all about Jesus and his best friends tell you a bunch of stories, that's where you need to be. But I love Old Testament, and so that's where we're going to be. We're going to start in 2 Samuel. This is the moment where David is now king. So King Saul has died. David, a man after God's own heart, becomes king. And he looks at the situation of the kingdom. And he says, we are in disarray and disunity. The tribes are not together. We do not have an area to worship. And he begins to unify everybody in Jerusalem. He says, I am going to make Jerusalem the center. It will be a political center and it will be a center of worship. But the problem with this was a few years earlier, like decades, the Ark of the Covenant, what they saw as the very embodiment and presence of God was stolen by the Philistines and taken away from them. And so part of David's job to bring the worship back to Jerusalem and unify the tribes, right? We need that today. To unify the people was to bring the presence of God to that place. And so David begins preparing and he decides that he will prepare an enormous parade. He gets 30,000 soldiers together. And on top of that, he gets all of the people of Israel who were not soldiers. And then he brings in musicians. I don't know about you, but that sounds like the outlining of a Salvation Army event, right? Let's get the musicians, let's get the soldiers, and let's get everybody else we can get. And let's bring them together and have a parade. The problem in this situation begins when David gets tired. He has taken over a kingdom. He has fought battles. He is working against disunity and he is weary. And now he is planning a nine mile long parade of people. He is organizing details. There is a problem when the man after God's own heart gets weary. And I think it's the same thing when a woman after God's heart gets weary. Sometimes we think, oh God, I'm really tired, but if I can just make it through to there, it'll be okay. And so we kind of pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we just start making things happen. This is when I like to say, not good ideas become great ideas. What do I mean by that? Somebody's like, hey, David, you got to get the ark nine miles down this road. I got a new cart. You can put it on my new cart. And David's like, it's a new cart. That's right. It's a new cart. It's got shiny gold on it. It's never been used. And David's like, that's a good idea. That's a great idea. Let's put the ark on the new cart. How many of you have sat somewhere and someone's like, hey, I got this new cart. You want this? This is a good idea. Right here, it's a new cart. And you look at it and maybe at first you think, I don't know about that, but it's new and it's shiny. You try it out. Well, maybe that could be a good idea. And David puts the ark on the new cart and he gets all the people together and he begins parading. They make it eight of the nine miles. And the way the Bible says it is you've got the Ark of the Covenant up front because you know you want God to lead. And you got that up there. You got the cart. You got the oxen. You got the one guy making sure the path is straight. You got the guy standing next to it. You got David in all his kingly glory. He's got his robes and his little thingamabobbers and his big thing. And he's got it. He is glory. I am King David. I am dancing and bringing the ark to Jerusalem. He's got 30,000 soldiers behind him. 
He has all the other people of Jerusalem. He's got tambourines. He's got cymbals. He's got all sorts of harpy thingies I can't even pronounce from the Bible. And they are marching, and they get eight miles into the parade, and they are celebrating. And I bet David was like, I did it. I can see the finish line. I'm going to rest in a minute. And then it happens. The oxen stumbles. Uzzah sees the ark, and he stops it from falling. And the scripture says, Uzzah died. But let me tell you something about that word. You see, Uzzah didn't die. He literally exploded. I want you to think about this for a minute. You got Uzzah standing next to the ark. You got David in all of his glory. They're walking. You know this. When somebody in front of you trips, you're still walking. You're like, whoa, right? David is up close. When Uzzah touches the ark, the way I see it is there was a stumble, there was a, <gasps> there was a touch, there was a, ah! Because Uzzah, poof! David is now standing covered in man guts next to an ark on a new cart. And I'm sure everybody back there was like, peace out! I mean, they're taking their tambourines and going home. They're not staying to see what happens next. Nobody cares about the parade. The confetti and ribbons, they're like, I don't know. The scriptures say, David became angry. He is so angry at that moment that he refuses to finish the parade. They, they can see the end. They're less than a mile from where their destination was to be. You see, I think David gets angry at himself because he's the one who planned it and he missed something. I think he gets angry at Uzzah for touching it. If he didn't touch it, then he wouldn't be covered in man guts. I think he's mad at God because he said, God, I did it all right. The only thing we were doing today was celebrating you. And you show up and explode the party. Now I'm covered in man guts. I think he's embarrassed because at this point in history, there is no other man who is respected for his relationship with the Lord more than David. And now the very people who said, you are a man after God's own heart, you are God's chosen king, are saying, I don't know what's going on with that man and God, but I don't want to be a part of it. And they're walking away. David is fearful. Like, if I did everything for you, God, and you exploded one of your own, what else will you do that I cannot expect? The scriptures say that David took the ark to the house of Obed-Edom, and he left it there. He said, I don't want the presence of God anywhere near me in my anger. You keep it. And he goes home covered in his man guts. The funny thing is, Scripture doesn't tell us anything about his arrival home at this point, but it tells us that he stays there for three months. For three months he sits in the knowledge of what just happened. I think this is important because so many of us live in a my whole world just exploded, but I got to pull it together enough to make it to here. I'm just going to run it out. I know if I saw that, I'd be like, guys, I don't know what happened, but it's us and the oxen. Don't touch the ark. Just run it home. Just get it over with. I don't want to restart this moment in life, right? I would have just been like, run it out. But David said, no, I will sit and I will sit in my anger and I will figure out why life exploded. And what he finds out in that three months, because now, now he actually takes time to sit and read the scriptures. Now he actually fills before the Lord compared to when he was planning the parade and he was on empty and he got drawn in by the new cart. 
David realizes the only time the Ark of the Covenant was ever transported by a cart was when the enemy stole it to take it into captivity. The enemy put it on a cart to take it away because they had no Levites to carry it. Because scripture said, I have given you a godly people and they will be the one to put the pole through the ark and carry it. And when six guys carry a cart, if one of them stumbles, it stays upright because there are five more. It is important that when you are carrying the spirit of God in you, you are surrounded by people who walk next to you. So when you stumble, they pick you up. And they say, it's all right that you stumbled. I got you. We're not losing God in this moment. I got you. You are walking with each other. You are here this weekend to celebrate together. Even if you don't feel like celebrating, someone is carrying the presence of God in you, for you, with you, to get you to the end but you cannot be drawn in by the new cart. There is stuff that has come out in the last few years that has said, you know what, you're better if you're alone. You're safer if you're masked and away. And yet God says, no, let's draw us in to a group of people that carries the ark the very presence of God together because in that there is strength because you will stumble and you will fall. But I have assembled a team. David, while he is away, begins to hear of Obed-Edom's house and the prosperity that is coming upon it as the ark is there. His fear of the Lord begins to dissipate and he assembles some Levites and he says, we are going to finish this parade. And he goes to the house of Obed-Edom. And he says, we're going to do it God's way, not man's way. You see, there is a way to celebrate the Lord man's way. And it can feel good for eight miles. It can feel like you are there. But when it hits the rock, you will lose it all. I want to tell you, it's okay to be angry at God when your life explodes. There are times that God will intentionally allow your life to explode before you so that you can back up, sit before him and say, God, what went wrong? And allow him to say, here is where you were headed. Here is where I want you. And I love you enough to walk you back into that place. I imagine as David planned the last few months of this parade, or the last few feet of this parade, I just, this part gets me giddy in awkwardness. Because the first parade was like, let's do it! And everyone's like, yeah! And they're bringing everything, right? Now David goes back. He's like, we're going to bring the ark the last half mile. Once they got to Obed-Edom's house, it was only half a mile. They're like, we only have half a mile. Let's get everybody out. And I imagine people are like, I got to wash my hair that day. You know, I, I'm sorry. My, my grandbaby's sick. I'm going to stay in the house. Nobody wants to go on the second parade. They're like, I'm sorry, but I saw God's man get blown up. Do you miss that? Did you? I'm not coming out for another one. Thanks. I mean, they're like, shut up. And David's like, okay. I mean, there's no, Scripture doesn't say there's 30,000 people in the second parade. No. It's David and the Levites that he commanded to be there. And they're like, yes, king. And they're thinking, why am I a Levite? Why am I a Levite? Right? They go to Obed-Edom's house and they get the ark and they're going to bring it home. And you know, they're all saying, don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Right? They're like, they are mentally lost. And David is still dealing with the embarrassment. Some of you will come through some horrible trials and you will get up and you'll get to a point where you're like, I know God is good, but I'm still looking at people who are looking at me like, what did you do wrong? Right? There are still people around me judging me. There are still people. And God's like, you do what I ask. 
You let me be the defender of your name. David did not knock on all the doors and say, it's okay, God won't blow you up. I promise. He just said, let's go. And he gets the ark. And the scripture is very clear. David is in front of the ark. And he's saying every six steps, one, two, three, four, five, six. The seventh step is an altar. Step six, they stop. David builds an altar out of all the rocks that the oxen could have stumbled on. And he takes an oxen and he sacrifices it right there. And he lets it burn before he'll take another six steps. I want you to picture this. It's half a mile from the first point to where the ark will rest. Every six steps, six steps is about 15 feet. We have about 150 to 160 altars being created along the main street of the city. All those people who wouldn't come, there is, this is outside their house. It's on the street in front of their front door. Has your neighbor ever had a barbecue and you've been like, oh, that smells good. I mean, this is like a barbecue happening in front of their house. And it's every 15 feet. The scripture said that there was either an ox or a fattened calf sacrificed every time. There's two types of offerings and sacrifices in the Bible. There is a fellowship offering, which when it is offered, the meat is essentially cooked and shared. And then there's one of sort of reconciliation where the entire animal is consumed for the glory of God. And it just burns, creating a sweet aroma. The offerings that David made along the way were both. Now imagine being in your house, peeking out the window, watching the very small parade to see if anybody else is going to explode on your front door, right? You're just looking, and you start smelling. And then the king comes. I have some meat and bread and sweet cake for you to join in the presence of the Lord. And he calls people out of their homes, out of their fear, out of their sort of separated curiosity but uncertainty of who this God is because of what they've seen in the past. And he says, come and join with me. Meat at this point is a delicacy. It's not something they had every day. It would have been like giving them the richest parts of the kingdom, handed to them in their front doors, for which they would eat off of for weeks. Because isn't that how God is? He's going to show up. And he's going to knock on your door, call you into his presence so that he can give you riches that will last. He wants you to be filled. He wants you to join in the celebration even when you're a little scared, even when you're not sure of what it'll look like. I'm positive some of you got to come here and you were like, I don't know about this women's thing. You want me to wear a yellow shirt? You, I'm in a pink shirt. You know I don't wear pink. I'm not sure about that, right? Some of you just a little bit like, mm, and your core officers are like, just come, just enjoy the sweet aroma. You're right, I'm not getting a slab of beef, but I sure did get a little bunt cake last night. I was like, draw me into that goodness, Lord. Here I am, right? There is goodness in the celebration of the Lord. But notice that God's way was every six feet, and you stop. Every six steps, God created six days. He rested on the seventh. There's something about number seven that's important in Scripture. It's a number of perfection. I want you for a minute to think of your days. Think in your head, everything you do, every step you take. What did you do this morning? You got out of bed. Some of you showered. You brushed your teeth. You got dressed. You got in the elevator and you walked to the car. Oh, six steps. On that seventh one, did you stop and say, God, be the glory. God, let me praise you in this moment. You want to know how to smell the aroma of God? 
You want to know how to enjoy the wealth that he has for you, which is the peace that surpasses understanding, the strength to make it through a day. I'm not talking money. Money doesn't solve what we've got wrong. It never does. But the peace and the strength from the Lord that pours down into us in moments when other people say, I just don't even know how you get out of bed in the morning. You're like, because I got the riches of the kingdom of heaven. But you want that? It's every six steps. David didn't put one altar at the beginning and hope that it would feed everybody. No, he created multiple altars along the way. And it says that between the first and the second altar, David danced. My favorite part is that he danced in his ephod. That's his underwear. You know why he was in his underwear? Because a man exploded on his kingly robes. Because he's like, I had to work those stains out the first time. My wife was so mad. I'm not working stains out of anything else. I'm going to do this in my underwear. Because I don't need to be the center. I don't need to be the glory. I don't need to be the one people look at as king. I need them directed to heaven. So I will dance in my underwear before whoever is watching. Right? I will dance. And when he gets home, he is feeling it. He knows he did it God's way. And there is laughter and there is joy from the highest point down to the lowliest of those in the kingdom. The servants of the servants came out to join him in the very presence of the Lord. And there is celebration with laughter. And David enters his house with the same gifts of meat and cake and breads. And he walks in and his wife is waiting for him. It's interesting to me that scripture calls her Saul's daughter. Because a woman at this time would have left her father's home and would have clinged to her husband and taken the identity of David's wife. But instead, she is referred to as Saul's daughter because somewhere in her heart, she never moved from the queen, gown, princess, royalty, to the daughter of the king and the wife of God, of man after God's own heart, right? She didn't move. She didn't make that transition. And so as she watches her husband dance, in her she is filled with disgust for him in his underwear. She's just waiting, and Scripture says, how disgusting are you that you would dance before the slave girl slaves and you would let them see your nakedness. <laughs> David, I just can't imagine this moment. He's walking with good gifts. He's like, I did it. The ark is home. The people are worshiping. We got it, babe. We're here. You disgust me. And he's like, I'm a little confused. Why? You danced naked before the slave. I wasn't naked. I had my underwear on. You know, like, you're like I wasn't naked. And, and I know in his head he's thinking, I don't really think the slave girl saw anything. Because I was, it's okay. You're right? Like, he's just he's like, it's okay. Here's this good stuff. And she continues. And David looks at her. And he knows his identity. He does not yell at her. He does not banish her from his house. He does not try to come out with, well, after, yeah, I was dancing. If you, you're the one who didn't want my robes dirty again. I didn't want to make you clean my laundry. Like, he, he doesn't do any of that. He simply says, those slave girls will look at me with respect because they know the one I honor is the king. The king of all kings. The God of the universe. The one who chose me to be king over your father. He nails it. He said, God chose me to be the king, not your father. I am in this position because my God put me here. And that's the end of the discussion. Scripture says that his wife became barren and had no children. I can't tell you if that's because she was actually barren or because there was such a large divide in the relationship between the two, she never had opportunity again to be pregnant. But what I can tell you is that when you know your identity in Christ, 
Those who come against you can be given a simple answer. I know who I am. I know who empowers me because it is the creator of the universe who has placed me here for this purpose. Amen? When you know who you are, nothing that comes against you will stand or prosper. When you know who you are, you can face all things that come your way. And it might be an explosion of your whole world that confuses you and makes you think, what did I do wrong? And God said, sit with me. Sit in my word and study so that you may know what my way is and not the world's way. Do not get drawn into the new cart when I've asked you to walk in community. Do not get drawn into the new cart when I have given you my way. But there's a problem. The new cart's shiny. It's real pretty. Lots of our friends are using the new cart. I might like a new cart. I mean, it's not really bad. The Bible doesn't say don't use the cart. So how do I know what's the new cart? I think part of that is learning to hear the voice of God. Hopefully you're doing that this weekend. I have a sound clip. And I know not everybody in this room speaks English, and I get that. But I think this sound clip is going to go across languages. So if you, for the purpose of the sound clip, can listen. It's in two parts. Everybody is going to hear the same thing, no matter what language you speak. I want you to hear the first sound clip. If it's possible, sound crew, can you play that first clip for me, please? I think that's our world. I think it's chaos. For me, I hear the little baby in that sound clip because I got two little babies at home and always in my head am I thinking, I wonder what their daddy's feeding them, right? <laughs> I just got it. It's in my head. How much of a mess will my house be when I arrive home? All right. I hear the pots and the pans and I think of the dishes. That's what I'm hearing. But we got it. We all have clutter. But in the midst of that clutter, Scripture is so clear that God speaks to us in a small, still voice. He speaks to us in a voice meant for us to hear, but only when we slow down and we stop and we sit and we listen. It took David three months to hear the voice of God clearly. We have to train ourselves. There's a second sound clip I want you to listen to that is the removal of all the clutter so that you can hear the voice of God. Can you play the second sound clip, please? I love you, and I have called you to a great purpose. I love you, and I have called you to a great purpose. This is a truth for every one of you in this room. The creator of the universe has a steadfast love for you, and he has called you to a great purpose, one far greater than you could ever ask or imagine. Keep that phrase and that voice in your head and listen to the first sound clip again. Can you play that? Did you hear it? Raise your hand if you heard it. It was there. It was there all along. You only missed it the first time because you didn't know what you were listening for. It is time to train yourself to hear the voice of God because he still speaks. He speaks in this country. He speaks in this place. He speaks in your kitchen. He speaks in the middle of your mess. He speaks to you. 
do not let anyone tell you God does not speak anymore. He does. He speaks. And it is important that you listen. And sometimes you get it because you read scripture. And then you have a moment and that scripture comes back in your head and you're like, oh, that's what it is. Sometimes you hear the voice of God because you wake up and you think a thought in your head that you know is not yours. Right? And it tells you, today I have a great purpose. Today I am worthy. And maybe it's the first time you have woken up and felt worthy in a year. That is the voice of God breaking through the clutter to tell you I have value in your life. And you are worthy. Sometimes you'll hear it in the music we sing. I love when Jennifer sings. Like I stand just dumbfounded on my face. Why? Because I can feel her ushering in the presence of God and clearing out clutter so that we can get our hearts ready. All through scripture, when the prophets wanted to hear the Lord, they said, get me music. This is biblical. I have students that I mentor and a few of them are great dancers. And I told one of them once, when I watch you dance, I see a girl speaking to her God. And she said, I hear God's voice clearly when I dance. And when she would come home from school on a rough day, she'd put music on and just dance in her room. And it was her prayer. And she said, I can feel his presence. There is no formula for how and when to hear the voice of God. It is going to be unique to who you are. I can stand up here and tell you that I really, oh golly, this is slightly embarrassing. I really like to pray in the bathroom. Okay, now I, I know that's a funny place, but as a mom, sometimes it's the only place you're alone. So I'm like, I got to go potty. You know, and I just sneak in there and I lock the door. Mommy needs privacy. Dear baby Jesus, help me, right? And my kids are like, Mommy, I know you're reading. I'm like, I'm not reading. Well, then you're talking to baby Jesus on the toilet. Yes, I am. But that might not work for some of you. Pants down. You're like, this is weird. How did that lady do it? It's okay. That's not your style. I can't dance. If I tried to dance to speak to God, God would be like, what are you doing? I mean, that's not me. Right? I have friends who like to run. I got this one friend. Her name is Katie. Uh Uh-huh. She's a cross-country runner. She's hilarious, right? I, we went to school in Upland, Indiana. It, there's like snow, like crazy snow up there. And she's a cross-country runner. And she said, you know, I just have to run to, to be with the Lord. So she decides she's going to go to our little fitness room, which our fitness room was not as big as this stage. Okay, they had treadmills and, and there was a wall. So you had to like shimmy in and get on the treadmill and run, right? And she's running, and she's like, here I am just looking at the poor dude over there on a bicycle. She's like, this is not communicating with the Lord. So she decides she's going to close her eyes. She's going to run, and she's going to envision the great lands that God has set before her. And she's running, and she's praying, and she's getting all into it. And the next thing she knows, she gets hit by a truck. She's in the gym. But what happened is her footing got off. Boom! The treadmill kicked her off into the wall, which she fell down from the wall, lands on the moving treadmill, and by the time she came back to the dorm, she's like bleeding. She's got rash burns. She's like, I said, what happened to you? She said, I don't know that I was communicating the right word to God. I said, obviously not. Did you two have a fight? I think whatever you do to speak to the Lord, it must be genuine to you, but it must be genuine to Him. It is not about you speaking to Him in a way that everybody else says, look at her. She is speaking to the... You're going to get thrown off that treadmill real fast if you're trying to be showy in your prayer. Scripture says, go to a closet. Some of you are like, I want to sit in my closet. That's a danger zone. Something could kill me. I understand that. But what God means is you find a way that allows you to speak in the privacy of your world to the Lord 
Because in that space, he can speak to you about hard things. He can speak to you about the stuff that might break you. He can speak to your heart where you have the freedom to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I know. I, I know that one. And it's going to be strange at first. You youngins in here, I love calling you youngins. Sorry, I don't mean it mean. It's just so sweet. Everybody under the age of 40, here's the deal. You might go home and be like, all right, I'm going to try what this preacher lady said. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to listen. All right, God, speak. You could be like, how long do you do this for? Here's my thing. You got to train yourself to do it. You got to train yourself so when you start, you pick up your Bible and you take it with you and you start in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because that is where God tells you all about his son using his best friends. If I want to know about you, I go to your best friend. I don't ask you about you. I talk to your best friend. They give me the best dirt. You go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and you read it. And you start saying, God, speak to me through the scriptures. And he might put it in your head and you don't hear anything. And then you're talking to a friend at dinner and you're like, boom, I got a word for you. Because God spoke to you. And you recognize it and you celebrate it. And you say, okay, I know my God is speaking to me. I know the creator of the universe cares. And when you have that word in your heart and somebody comes up to you and says, you want my new cart? You're like, that is a fancy cart, but I'm doing life God's way. I don't need your new cart. Everybody over, I'm going to say, I, I know I'm skipping a group here and I got like mm, no time, but I'm going to do it anyways. Everybody over 60, I want to tell you something. You have the loudest voice in the upcoming generation. Your voice is louder than their parents. Do not back away from speaking truth. If you are a grandmother, you are so powerful in the kingdom of God. I know this. I have teenagers who tell me, oh yeah, my grandma told me my outfit was ugly and my pink hair was dumb. I said, how'd you feel about that? She goes, well, I guess my grandma's got a point. I said, did your mom tell you anything? She told me the same thing. Did you listen? No, I listened to my grandma. I'm like, really? But not your mom? Grandmas, please know, you are listened to. If you see your grandkid doing something dumb, just walk up and be like, that's dumb. I'm 85 years old. I have the right to tell you that's dumb. Speak truth. Pray. If you can still get to your knees, pray for those grandkids of yours because that's what they need. If you don't have your own grandkids, look around your core and be like, man, that youngin needs a grandma. And just say, can I be your grandma? Every little kid's going to say, yeah. My kids have so many grandparents. My husband's like, which grandparent is that? I'm like, don't worry. It's just another one. They call this one sugar mama, this one Nana, this one. They got so many. And I'm like, praise Jesus. They're not going to fall in a hole. If you in that middle group, you have purpose on both ends. You have time to speak into the generation coming, and you have time to sit and listen to the wisdom of the generation that has gone before you. Do not miss the opportunity to listen, because they will tell you a lot about how to avoid the new cart. Every six steps. What would it look like for you to stop and worship the Lord? Maybe you have a card in your pocket and every six steps you pull it out and you read a Bible verse. Maybe you have a friend who calls you every day at a certain time because that is the sixth hour of your day. Do not forget to worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you will explode our lives in order to get us back on track, that you love us enough to not permit us to walk in the wrong way. You keep us from doing it man's way and direct us into your way. And I ask that you give each one of these women your voice in their ear, that they may hear you, that they may stay away from the new cart, and that they may find a way to worship you in their day, every day, bringing up the generation to come and the generation before us in a way that honors you and ushers in your kingdom. And all of God's women said, Amen. Amen.
Come on, let's praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on and stand up on your feet. And we're going to sing What a Fellowship. We are leaning on the everlasting arms.
yes, we are leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Make a shout for Jesus tonight. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. While you're standing there, we're just going to sing hallelujah. Glory to God. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We honor you. You're our salvation, our glory, our power, Lord Jesus. It is in you that we move, we breathe, and we have our being. Hallelujah. Everyone lift your voices and sing, sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, sing. Salvation and glory, honor and power unto the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord.
a worthy God. You are a mighty God. We worship you, Lord God. We honor you to this morning, Lord Jesus. Come on, where you're standing in your living room, in the chapel, begin to worship our King. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. For he is Lord. He is Lord. Sing that one more time. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is here, y'all. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead. And he
Just worship him, just worship him, just worship him. Oh, it doesn't matter what your worship looks like. Ignore the person that is sitting next to you and worship him. Oh, we worship you, Lord God. We worship a risen Savior. We hail the line of Judah. We hail the King of glory. all God's people said, amen. Beautiful. Thank you, Jennifer and the praise team for leading us in a powerful way. And thank you, Jennifer, two Jennifers, for bringing us into 2 Samuel in a very powerful way. We won't read it the same, will we? We'll see her in those yellow pants parading across the stage. God bless you as you've shared with us today. It's been an honor, and it is an honor to sit under your ministry. Ladies, it's good to have everybody back in this chapel this morning for a powerful first session today. Hasn't it, Benita? Absolutely. <laughs> and we have some celebration shops for you uh, that is going to happen uh, during our lunchtime today. The tables on this mezzanine is going to have some specialty items for sale. So please stop by and purchase some goodies. Uh, many of them are going towards our Mexico project as well as some independent vendors that we have as well. And Benita, why don't you tell them about the breakout sessions? I sure will. Ladies, if you can all hold up your badge, you have this beautifully folded sheet of paper that have all the breakouts listed here. And um, 
their active sessions and educational sessions. Um, under our active sessions, we have Dance Through Life with Amanda Colding. And we have Diamond Art, beautiful class, which will be led by Clarissa. We have Jazzercise, oh my goodness, that will be led by Rebecca Shaw. And Smile, Paint, and Celebrate, which will be led by Miss Terry. And under our educational venues, we have Realizing Your Worth, Jennifer Date. St the Struggle is Real, Colonel Susan Buckowitz. Vibrant Living Through Self-Care, Dr. Vasantha Raj. You versus the Mirror, Apostle Aquinla Hunter. So flip it open, and it should be listed on your badge which classes you should take. Just in case you forgot, ladies, Benita's got it on your tag. It's here. So ladies, what we are asking is that if you are not assigned to that class, please do not go into that class because those classes have certain amounts that they can take. So please make sure you stick to what's on your lanyard. Also inside your lanyard, you will see you have two tickets in there. Do not lose these tickets. They are your lunch ticket and a dessert ticket. And ladies, for the first time, we've got food trucks at Women's Retreat. They're gonna be on both sides, I believe. So find your food truck. Guess what? You only can go to one, okay? You've gotta pick which style of food you want. And then the uh, dessert is going to be in the gym area, right? So she does not have a truck. Sugar Mama is, uh, she's Sugar unloading Mama. in the gym. So uh, they will be serving from 11.30 to one. So don't try to get there early. Yes, they're getting stuff ready, but don't go early. 11.30 to one is the time frame. We'll have plenty of food for everybody and looking forward to it's pizza, Wings, Chinese, Jamaican, hamburgers, and plenty more. Something for everybody. That's right. So ladies, as we conclude, be remindful that session three will start at one o'clock. So please be back and ready for the celebration to continue. Have and what time afternoon. do the breakouts start? Is it 10.30? It is 10.30. So we've got a little, you've got a few minutes to find your way. Enjoy your breakout at 10.30, ladies. We'll see you back here then.